Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. Today I want to talk about a unique aspect of Missouri law regarding jury instructions. As you probably know, jury instructions are read to the jury right before they go back to deliberate. In fact, jury instructions are actually read at the beginning of the trial, throughout the trial, and then again at the end of the trial. Not all of them, but many of them are read repeatedly, particularly with regard to don't talk about this case, don't deliberate prematurely, that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, when you get to the point where you're ready to submit the case to the jury, you have to instruct the jury as to what they, what facts they have to find in order to rule for the plaintiff or for the defendant, as the case may be. That is not always easy to set out. And in fact, jury instructions cause a lot of headaches for lawyers in every state, but particularly in Missouri, because there is a concept known as the roving commission. We'll talk about that more in a little bit, but let's take a look first at what a good jury instruction looks like. Here is a verdict directing instruction, which is what the plaintiff submits in order to get a verdict, and it instructs the jury on what facts to base their claim for negligence. And here, this one which was approved by the court, defendant failed to keep a careful lookout. Now, while careful is a little bit vague, that has been used as a term of art in Missouri for a long time, and basically careful lookout just means you're looking around to see what's going on. And then defendant Beck drove at an excessive speed. Or defendant Beck drove at a speed which made it impossible for defendant Beck to stop within the range of his visibility. You see what the court is, or what the judge is doing when he's instructing that. He's giving him specific facts. Did he keep a careful lookout? Was he looking around, seeing where he was going? Did he drive too fast, period? Or did he drive at a speed that made it impossible for the defendant to stop within the range of his visibility? Which means, of course, that even if he wasn't speeding, if he was going too fast for conditions and couldn't see far enough ahead of him, or perhaps couldn't see because of his headlights, that would be a fact that if they found that, could constitute liability. So you tie it down to specific facts. Tying these issues down to specific facts, however, has given many, many litigants a difficult time over the last couple of years. Let's look at one of those cases. So this is a case from 2012 involving a guy by the name of Dave McNeil in the city of Kansas City. And he appealed from an order issued by the circuit court granting a new trial in an action against the city of Kansas City for wrongful demolition of a building that he owned. In Missouri, if you have a bad outcome at trial and you have made objections, you've made proper objections, and you can articulate a good reason for the court to do so, the court can grant you a new trial on its own review of the evidence and its own review of the facts. And in this case, that's what happened. So here are the facts. In the summer of 2008, McNeil purchased a property containing a building on Paseo Boulevard in Kansas City, and McNeil notified the city that he planned to renovate the building as a multi-tenant residential property and made sure that all the outstanding taxes had been paid. In June of 2009, the city sent a letter to him saying, look, you need to remove some of the debris on the property and get these weeds under control, and it also requested a meeting with him. McNeil notified the city the lawn would be mowed and the weeds pulled. On June 29th, McNeil met with City Inspector Smith and Codes Enforcement Supervisor Parks. Parks was filling in for Codes Enforcement Supervisor Kreider, who was the Codes Enforcement Supervisor regularly assigned to that file. McNeil explained his plans and his financing difficulties to them. He informed them that his brothers had recently agreed to co-sign loans and that he would be able to obtain financing in the near future. Smith and Parks told McNeil he would have more time to get financing and fix up the building. They also directed him to remove a pile of debris from de from, and demolition material from the patio. So McNeil went about doing that and graded the yard, and then on August 8th, the city demolished the building without having any further contact with McNeil. 
And as you can see, in doing that, they disregarded the policy of the Dangerous Buildings Division to send him a pre-demolition notice. Neither Smith nor Parks had noted McNeil's July 20 phone call in the file or ever verbally mentioned their June 24 promise of additional time to Kreider. The city subsequently sent McNeil a bill for the demolition costs. Wow, how great is that? Not only do we demolish your building without asking you, but we also bill you for it. Uh, I don't imagine Mr. McNeil was very happy. So McNeil filed a petition in the circuit court claiming that the city had wrongfully dem demolished his building. The city filed a counterclaim saying, hey, we want costs and interest and fees associated with demolishing your building. After a four-day jury trial, the jury returned a verdict in favor of McNeil on his wrongful demolition claim for $150,000 and awarded no damages on the city's counterclaim. Subsequently, the city filed a motion for judgment notwithstanding the verdict or for a new trial. In relevant part, the city claimed that the trial court had erroneously submitted over the city's objection an instruction containing a roving commission. After hearing argument, the trial court agreed with the city and entered its order granting a new trial based upon instructional error. McNeil challenges that decision on appeal. Now, my old boss used to say that the secret to appellate success was to represent the respondent, and that's because there is a bias in favor of the trial judge. The courts are going to think, the appellate courts are going to think, that he exercised his discretion properly in granting the new trial. So our appellant here has a hard road to hoe in order to get to the point where he can get some relief. Let's see how the court deals with that issue. They go through the statute that authorizes the action, and then they get down to the jury instructions that were essentially the problem that caused the court to reverse the verdict in favor of the plaintiff. And the jury instructions were read as this. Your verdict must be for plaintiff if you believe first defendant wrongfully demolished the building owned by plaintiff, which was mentioned in the evidence. And as a result, the, the plaintiff was damaged. The court says prejudicial and reversible error con it occurs when an instruction gives the jury a roving commission. And a roving commission is an abstract instruction in such broad language as to permit the jury to find a verdict without being limited to any of the issues of fact or law developed in the case. So in the first example of a good instruction, you saw that they were tied to the facts of that case. Driving too fast, failing to keep a careful lookout. Those are facts that the jury can find and attach to liability. But here, there's no guide to the jurors as to what acts made this wrongful. Now, if the jury instruction had read first, your verdict must be for the plaintiff if first you believe that uh, the city inspectors did not communicate with their supervisors. Second, if you believe that they failed to make note of their promise to grant more time. Third, if you believe that they granted him additional time, but then demolished the building without having that time elapsed, those would all be facts that you could use to support a verdict in favor of the plaintiff. This is important because where an instruction submits a question to the jury in broad, abstract ways, it's considered this roving commission because it doesn't provide the defendant with any notice of what it is that the wrongful thing, wrongful thing that was done. And the other part of this is, in order for a jury instruction to be valid, it has to be supported by admissible evidence. And so there needs to be at least some admissible evidence tied to the jury instruction. For instance, in this case, if they had failed to communicate the fact that they had granted him additional time to people up and down the chain of command so that somebody could have realized, hey, we shouldn't be doing this but they didn't use those facts, and as a result, it was a roving commission. This is another case that involves a questionable jury instruction. And in this case, it isn't the plaintiff's jury instruction that's faulty. It is the defendant's jury instruction that's faulty. The plaintiff gets to tell the jury what they can do to give them a verdict. The acts of negligence, as we'll see, or in this case, product liability, as we'll see in this case. But the defendant also gets to come in and say, hey, look, there are these affirmative defenses that we've pleaded, and if you find any of these de affirmative defenses, well, then you can't find in favor of the plaintiff. So 
This involves a really tragic accident. This guy is working on a skid loader, and as a result, it falls and crushes him. They take him to the hospital, but he doesn't make it. So they bring a product liability action. During the instruction conference, the defendant here offered the following comparative fault instruction. In your verdict, you must assess a percentage of fault to the plaintiffs if you believe, first, defendant failed to use the skid steer as reasonably anticipated by the manufacturer, or decedent used the skid steer for a purpose not intended by the manufacturer, or decedent used the skid steer with knowledge of a danger involved in such use with reasonable appreciation of the consequences and the voluntary and unreasonable exposure to the said danger, or defendant, you know, we go through all of these, right? And as a result, in any one of those respects, he was thereby negligent, then the court refused to submit the proffered comparative fault instruction to the jury. So they talk about the standard of review, and they come down there and they say, CNH appeals what, that it should have been permitted an instruction on comparative fault. However, in doing so, CNH sidesteps a critical fact. It proffered a faulty instruction. CNH's instruction was patterned on the statute and listed nearly verbatim five of the six types of fault. And all of these are related to church's specific conduct. As a general rule, where the law is embodied in a statute, it is sufficient in instructions to the jury to follow the language of the statute. But you knew there had to be a however, didn't you? There are, however, exceptions to the rule, especially where the terms of the statute are general and indefinite. And this is such a case, as submitting these defenses solely in their statutory form likely would constitute this roving commission. Because again, the pattern instruction that he submitted said he used it in a manner not intended by the manufacturer. Well, there have to be some facts that establish that. So it would be if you believe that he, you know, picked up the lawnmower and tried to use it as a hedge clipper and as a result lost his fingers, that would be a situation where you have a fact that you are asserting in the instruction that gives the jury a tangible hook into behavior that could reasonably support a verdict. But in, his, in this case, they determine that it is indeed a roving commission. Now, I've looked at the law in several other states, and many other states don't have this issue about a roving commission. But they really should, and the reason for that is pretty clear. First, if you don't tie a, an act or a, an omission to the thing that you claim to be negligent or even the thing you claim to be criminal, if you don't tie it to something specific, then the jury can just wander through the evidence and pick you know, one from column A and one from column B, tie them together, wrap them up in a nice bow, and say, okay, you know, we find liability. And that's not the way the law is supposed to work because when you file a petition or a complaint in federal court, you have to give a statement of the facts that entitle you to relief. And that's to put the defendant on notice. These are the things you have to defend against. And if you wind up giving them a general instruction, well, they can pick any number of things outside of the narrow parameters that you pleaded and go with that in order to find liability. And you don't want that to happen because that's a denial of due process. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. This was a difficult video for me today. I kept getting my tongue tied. Ah, I hate it when that happens. But I think I finally got to the end of the video. Hope you've enjoyed this little dissertation on Missouri law and particularly on jury instructions. Maybe the next time you see something having to do with jury instructions, this will ring a bell and you'll be able to intelligently discuss the issue of jury instructions with someone else. Now, I would point out very clearly that up until about 10 years ago, I had a lot of trouble with jury instructions. But I had to go through a trial and we had to iron out some pieces of evidence in order to get a decent jury instruction fashion. And oh my goodness, that was a really tough case. And it taught me a lot about these jury instructions. There are a lot of lawyers in Missouri who don't understand the idea of a roving commission. And there are a lot of lawyers in Missouri who do not understand jury instructions. Sad but true.
It is one of those technical things in the law that if you don't understand it, it's really difficult to prevail. Because if the judge gives your instruction and it's a faulty instruction, it's the judge's error, but it's your case that's going to get reversed because of it. So that's what I have for you. Thanks for watching. Do something nice for somebody out there today and come back and catch me down here at the beach again tomorrow. We'll talk about something else interesting. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.